This is episode three of a five-part series meant to go over two proposals to make new buildings cleaner and more energy efficient. Thanks for continuing on. My name is Hugo Wong, and I work at the Building and Safety Standards Branch, the part of the government of British Columbia responsible for building codes and standards. If you do not build or design large buildings and are only interested in the proposals for small buildings like single-family homes and row homes, it's safe to skip right along to episode four, which deals with those buildings. So let's start with large buildings, known as part three buildings. Conceptually, the energy efficiency and decarbonization tactics are similar for all buildings regardless of size. But with large buildings, there are more complicated mechanical systems and a lot more coordination between professionals during the design phase of the building. It's known as an integrated design process, and the basics of that process and the benefits are explained in episode two. Large buildings are used for many different purposes, like hotels, theaters, restaurants, offices, and so on. Each of these uses is known in the BC Building Code as an occupancy classification or occupancy. That refers to how the building will be used after it's built. Most times the occupancy classification and the casual conversational term are the same or similar, such as hotels and motels or mercantile occupancies. However, there are times when it's not so easy to discern. For example, the term other residential occupancies typically refers to everything that's not a hotel or motel, which is basically apartments, condominiums, etc. The occupancy classifications listed on this slide, groups C, D, and E, are the ones currently covered by energy step code, and they're the ones that will be most affected by the higher energy efficiency minimums we're proposing. The proposed building carbon pollution standard is also meant for these buildings. This doesn't include all buildings, but they are the co most commonly built ones in British Columbia. I'll go into a bit more detail on the next slide. So, part three buildings. No major changes here. The current step two will be the norm for the most commonly built step code archetypes. That's office, residential, hotels and motels, and retail or service occupancies. We're proposing a performance-based code with no prescriptive option, but with slightly stricter metrics for office and retail. As the National Energy Code for Buildings, or NECB, recently changed their baselines for office and retail archetypes to be stricter than previous step two targets, we felt it appropriate to raise step two requirements in response. So, step two would require an improvement over NECB rather than a step back. Next, we move to public sector occupancies. That's an informal catch-all term referring to schools, libraries, colleges, recreation centers, hospitals, and care centers. In our research, we found that these buildings can vary widely in terms of their energy usage, and so we've not yet created a single simple target. There's more work to be done here, but we do want to see some improvements. In the past, we created some step one targets, which indicated that these buildings must meet at least part eight of the NECB. Energy modeling and air leakage testing are required if meeting step one. Currently, local governments could choose to require the step one option for public sector buildings in their communities. Design and build teams could choose to meet or beat it. However, to create some improvement in the meantime, we are proposing to require all applicable public sector buildings meet part eight of NECB, as well as conduct energy modeling and air tightness testing. There are no specific TEDI or TUI requirements yet. This option will also be renamed as step two for simplicity's sake. Although public sector buildings will not be required to be 20% more energy efficient in the BC Building Code, many of these buildings already aim to meet higher energy efficiency, resilience, and emissions targets. Provincial or federal funding also requires public sector buildings to be built to a high standard of energy efficiency. Finally, other occupancies not currently covered under step code, which include restaurants, cafes, theaters, prisons, industrial occupancies, etc., will need to meet part 10. This is generally a higher standard than before, though not necessarily 20% better in all instances. Again, due to the breadth of building types and uses, we focus first on the most commonly built buildings. Since the part three proposal is largely similar to the existing energy step code targets, let's just focus on the two proposed changes, which involve slightly stricter energy efficiency metrics for office and retail occupancies. Here, total energy use intensity, or TUI, as well as thermal energy demand intensity, or TEDI, are expressed in kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. On the left in purple are the current energy step code metrics for offices, and on the right are the proposed changes. You'll see that in climate zones four through six, so areas with heating degree days at or below 4,999, the TUI targets are set to 110 instead of 130. And in climate zones seven A through eight, 
that is areas with heating degree days greater than 4,999. The TUI targets are set at 115 instead of 130. TEDI targets remain the same. These new Step 2 targets present a range of energy savings compared to NECB, depending on the size and shape of the building. For a more detailed analysis on how the new targets compare to the old ones, read the update to the Metrics Research Report, available alongside the other supplementary materials on gov.bc.ca slash building codes. On the left in purple are the current step code metrics for retail occupancies, and on the right are the proposed changes. You'll see that in climate zones 4 through 6, the TUI targets are set to 145 instead of 170. And in colder climates, the TUI targets are set to 170 instead of 190. TEDI targets, again, remain the same. As with offices, these new Step 2 targets for retail occupancies present a range of energy savings compared to NECB, depending on the size and shape of the building. For more information, review the update to the Metrics Research Report on gov.bc.ca slash building codes. Just like Part 9 buildings, Part 3 buildings can generally meet the different levels of decarbonization by changing key pieces of space conditioning and hot water equipment to low or zero carbon options. Decarbonizing either space conditioning or hot water tends to get most large buildings to the medium level. Decarbonizing both gets most large buildings to the low level. Decarbonizing all systems make buildings zero carbon ready. I want to bring up an important distinction. You will see throughout the code proposals that the phrase zero carbon ready is written instead of just zero carbon. Are they different goals? The short answer is no. Building codes regulate buildings, not the energy sources that go into them. Utility providers and other parts of government are responsible for requiring and supplying lower carbon fuels to these buildings. In short, we as building code writers make buildings ready for zero carbon fuel. Utility providers and other parts of government provide the zero carbon fuel to finish the job. If the plan includes on-site renewable energy like solar, for a portion of the energy consumption, that's factored in too. Before we get too far, I just want to clarify again that this proposal only covers operational carbon, which are the emissions associated with the actual use of the building. It does not address embodied carbon, which accounts for emissions from all parts of the building's life cycle, from manufacturing components to deconstruction. The provincial approach is conceptually similar to one taken in the city of Vancouver, where greenhouse gas intensity limits are different for different occupancies. However, their limits are lower, in part because they only have one climate zone to contend with, whereas these targets are designed to be appropriate for all climate zones in BC, warm or cold. Notice that these are also performance only, with no prescriptive code option. As a reminder, these targets are GHGI, or greenhouse gas intensity limits, which limit the amount of emissions associated with each heated square meter of the building. That's different from an absolute GHG approach, which specifies an upper limit of emissions for the whole building on an annual basis, rather than each heated square meter. I'll go over the medium, low, and zero carbon ready targets for each occupancy. The GHG levels for hotels and motels are 9, 4, and 2 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per square meter per year. The GHG levels for other residential occupancies, for which non-code users refer to uh, apartments and condominiums, are 7, 3, and 1.8 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per meter squared per year. For offices, the GHG levels are 5, 3, and 1.5 kilograms of CO2e per meter squared per year. And finally, for other business or personal services or mercantile occupancies, for non-code users, that refers to retail stores, big box stores, that sort of thing. They're 6, 3, and 2 kilograms of CO2e per meter squared per year. Notice that hotels and motels have the highest GHG allowances. Offices have the lowest and retail and other residential occupancies are somewhere in between. Why? Why? Hotels and motels typically have higher energy use because they often need to heat swimming pools, operate commercial kitchens, and do lots of laundry. Those activities typically don't happen in offices. So it made sense for us to distinguish between these different occupancies. Measuring carbon emissions from buildings requires a set of energy modeling guidelines which describe how emissions intensive each energy source is. In other words, it assigns an emissions factor for every unit of energy, for example, 0.011 kilograms of CO2e per kilowatt hour. These factors are a snapshot in time, 
and are a sophisticated estimate, but don't always reflect the true emissions of an energy source because emissions can fluctuate. For example, most electricity consumers in BC are connected to the integrated electricity grid, which is supplied mostly by hydroelectricity and is at least 93% clean by legislation. However, there are times when emissions change if the utility purchases higher carbon energy to supplement the hydroelectricity supply when customers are using more power. Although there are plans to make the integrated grid 100% clean in the coming years, the emissions factor still fluctuates as of August 2022. Our partners in the building sector have told us, however, that a stable and predictable building code, where specifications remain the same for several years at a time, are important because buildings take years to design and build. If requirements changed all the time, design and costing estimates would change too. So, to provide some certainty and stability for builders when utilities are rapidly decarbonizing, the proposed building carbon pollution standard will base its performance levels on emissions factors set by the City of Vancouver's energy modeling guidelines. We're doing that because this approach is already in place in many BC communities, so it's familiar to the industry and will help them transition from existing local GHG policies without the sticker shock of different GHG values from what they're used to. Although there are lots of ways to calculate emissions factors out there, we're proposing this approach because we think it is the most straightforward way to influence choices during the design and construction phase. As utilities decarbonize, the actual emissions of buildings will decrease, and when their emissions settle, we can see if this approach needs to be revisited. Because we're more interested in influencing building decisions as opposed to accurate emissions accounting, we are proposing to use a single set of emissions factors for electricity, regardless of whether the building is connected to the integrated grid or the Fort Nelson grid, which has significantly higher emissions. We know that this approach will not accurately represent emissions from building operation in the Fort Nelson area, but it does provide a simple way for builders to make choices about how to decarbonize their buildings during construction, as well as the equipment they install, or the shape of the building. The granular details needed by design professionals will be in a modeling rule set, which is currently in development, so stay tuned for that. On the gas side, there are also big efforts to reduce carbon intensity. There's significant interest in renewable natural gas, or RNG, as a way to decarbonize the conventional natural gas supply. Also known as biomethane, it's a refined form of biogas, which comes from landfills, oil production, agriculture, sewage treatment, and other activities where biogas would otherwise be released into the atmosphere and contribute to climate change. As of August 2022, a proposal from Fortis BC to introduce RNG at scale is currently before the BC Utilities Commission, or BCUC, which is an independent agency of the provincial government responsible for regulating British Columbia's energy utilities. The BCUC has not issued a decision on the proposal yet. Now, given these variables, the draft code language is written to include future energy options, and terms like decarbonized fuels were chosen specifically to account for the breadth of possibilities. However, given the urgency of climate change, we are choosing to issue a code proposal now so builders and local governments can start using it at scale. And when a decision is released, we will read it closely and assess if and how it affects the code language. Regarding district energy systems, which distribute thermal energy like steam to multiple buildings in an area or neighborhood, we think there's too much variability in specific systems used in BC for any single solution, as emissions vary by the fuel source of these systems. That flexibility is what makes district energy so attractive, yet it does pose some challenges when trying to create a provincial solution. We've heard local governments prefer to leave any discussion of emissions factors between them and the district energy provider. So that's what we're proposing, which is consistent with the City of Vancouver Energy Modeling Guidelines. I realize that may be a significant amount of information. You don't need to memorize it all in order to be familiar with the code proposal. But we hope that you come away from it understanding that the Building Carbon Pollution Standard facilitates a lot of different policy goals for communities, and for builders, and for the general public. For communities that want to build capacity, the measure only level will provide that opportunity. For other communities interested in partially or fully decarbonizing their new buildings, this path provides that option too. 
While this building carbon pollution standard is designed for local opt-in at first, the province's most recent climate plan envisions gradually requiring new buildings to emit less carbon until 2030, when all new construction is expected to be zero carbon. As with Energy Step Code, we will be in close communication with leading local governments to refine the standard over time and build capacity in all areas of BC to meet this commitment. As we conclude this episode, I know that some people may want more detail than this presentation provides. There are written materials which contain more technical and costing analysis, including the 2022 update to the metrics research report, GHG data tables which show examples of how large buildings can meet the proposed GHG requirements, and a local government best practices bulletin, which was written in collaboration with the StepCode peer network. Again, modeling rule sets which are currently in development will provide the granular detail necessary for design professionals in order to implement any potential standard. The next episode will focus on the BC Building Code proposals for improved energy efficiency and the carbon pollution standard for Part 9, or small buildings. See you there.